letsthinkshow.com. We have back on the air today, Bethany. And Bethany uh, chatted with me recently, and we just had a good old time talking about libertarianism. And she is back to chat with us some more. How are you doing today, Bethany? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Just having a lovely day. Uh, and so I, I thought this time I'd ask get to know you a little bit better. Um, I, I understand you're married with children. Is uh, is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. I have three kids and I've been married to my husband for 12 and a half years. And I count in halves because I figure every month counts. <laughs> there you go. That's the way it is with marriage, right? Even when it's wonderful, not everybody gets <laughs> to stick with it for a long time. Yep. How, how old are your kids? Um, I have a um, we're to the almost time of the year. So I have an almost 12 year old, almost 11 year old and an almost five year old. Oh, cool. Cool deal. He, my little guy, he, uh, he actually just got to go to North Dakota yesterday. He, he's going to go work with dad for the week. Oh, neat. Neat. Yep. yep. So oh, that's going to be excited. fun. Not a, he says, since when does a little boy get to go to work with his dad? <laughs> that so, is pretty special. <laughs> so he's learning the oil field this week. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, you're involved in the libertarian movement. I'm just kind of wondering, what's, uh, what's something you wish you had known that you know now that you didn't when you first kind of became active as, a, as an activist? What do you wish you had known when you first got started? I wish I would have read more. Um, I feel like we learn history too early in our lives sometimes before we care. And um, I don't know if I, I, I feel like I lost years of reading that I could have been um, studying more and understanding earlier. Interesting point. That is a very good point, I'm thinking. Not that you needed my permission. Yeah. <laughs> I just, it, you know, it's interesting. I wish I could do anything to go back to civics class or if we had them in school anymore, but um, learning all those things that you learn in school, uh, just go back and actually pay attention this time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are some of the best books or I guess there's a lot of ways of getting information, podcast videos. What are some of the, maybe the best two or three resources that have had a big change, uh, caused a big change in your life? Um, probably Audible, to be honest. I learned that I read better, I process better when I hear things. And so that has really been a game changer. And then I was listening to a podcast one day and they suggested listening to things at 1.5 speed. And yes. so now I can consume more information quicker. And um, sometimes I find I have to slow things down for my brain to process. I was listening to the Federalist Papers a while ago, and those are a little bit difficult at 1.5 speed. <laughs> There's too much in there to try to um, tear apart. But um, Audible, and then I really like to just find myself some good podcasts. Um, one of my favorite thinkers at the moment um, that has a great podcast is the Jefferson Hour and that is with Clay Jenkins and he does impersonations of Jefferson but he has a podcast where he'll kind of go through modern day things from Thomas Jefferson's point of view. Oh neat. And he's really good because he's not an apologist for the things that were bad about Jefferson. He's fully willing to accept that he definitely had faults, and that's one of my favorite parts about it, is that if you're going to look at history, we have to understand the faults of another person um, to realize that we're allowed to have our own faults. Although my faults may not be as big as Thomas Jefferson's, I'm still allowed to have the issues that I have that make me far from perfect. That's a good point. I've, it makes me think of the the guy that weighs 400 pounds that tells you it's a good idea to drink a couple glasses of water every day. Well, mm-hmm. he's still right. Maybe he didn't yeah, live it. Maybe wrong. he did some stuff wrong, but he's right. Yep. It's good for you. And and it's hard for, I think it's hard for people to stand in the shoes of somebody who lived before and what their society said um, was right and wrong. I know that there's a lot of things in our society that are wrong that people still do but why should we look at we should always look through the lens of what today says rather than what the lens of 30 40 years 100 200 years from now says that's an interesting perspective 
interesting perspective. So the Jefferson Hour, what are some other things you've listened to or read uh, that might be uh, just kind of a game changer for somebody who's thinking, eh, the, the libertarian thing's kind of neat, but it's also kind of wacko and fringe and out there. What are, I, what are some good introductory things? I really like Adam Grant. He wrote a book called... Um, Oh man, he has some fantastic books there. I haven't found one that's bad yet. Let me find the um, originals. And originals. it talks about- I've heard of that, yeah. It is so good. I've listened to it so many times. Um, and then he has a couple others. He has a book coming out in February that I'm just dying to sink my teeth into. Um, a big game changer for me recently, as odd as it was, I had never read anything by Orwell until last year. And so I started with Animal Farm and went to um, 1984. And I have to say, I don't know how smart it is to listen to 1984 right before a pandemic set, um, sets in. It, <laughs> you see some it, similarities. <laughs> yeah, I've struggled over the last 12 months um, since I read that book. Just kind of, I always kind of like would tend to see those things in society, but now it's like, my eyes have been opened so much more. And um, I think that there's seriousness to be taking out of the pandemic, but I think the misinformation and changing the narrative every single day is the part that um, is crazy that we're basically being told everything we've taught before was four and we're supposed to say three now is, is a little intense. Right. Did you find that after Animal Farm, when you look at things that are going on, you sometimes uh, will uh, put the characters on people? Yeah. You're like, oh, that's Boxer. <laughs> yeah. I did that a lot in the campaign. Um, when I ran for office, uh, I was I was definitely labeling people with pigs and horses. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's crazy. My, uh, and I actually had, I felt, I feel like Animal Farm is a good one for, um, it's malleable enough that a kid can listen to it. So I had my 11 year old listen to it and she really enjoyed it. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yep. What is a, uh, a common myth? Cause I, I mentioned a little bit ago that some people think libertarianism is kind of wacko and out there and such. What's a common myth about libertarianism, uh, that you'd, like to take an opportunity to kind of debunk and say, no, that's not how it is. <laughs> so I think it's the idea of personal liberties and what's that, what that means. Um, like a lot of times I get, I don't get this as much in my own personal life, but it, there was a little bit of stream through it from my last campaign of, um, that I wanted to legalize prostitution and drugs and that it's all drugs every day. And I think that what people realize is that when we have all of the laws put in place right now that we have, we're not actually able to help the people who the laws are there for. So like with drugs, somebody was attacking my husband last week saying that they had seen a baby that was living in a house, um, chewing on the crack pipe and all of the terrible things that we automatically perceive with drugs like meth and like some of those really bad terrible things. Well, the problem is, is that our, in my opinion, our jails are too full of innocent people that have decided to do those kinds of things, but not hurt another person, that we don't have room for the true monsters, for the true people in society that are doing awful things to children, that are um, not being able to manage their life. And quite frankly, in some respect, the idea that um, that it is a mental illness rather than just somebody got stuck on drugs and now they're a piece of shit. Right, right. Um, I think that's a hard thing for people. Like people don't like, I don't like drugs. I don't want anybody ca caught up in that loop like anybody else. It's just that we, our jails are full of innocent people who have not harmed a single other human. Do, do you notice in your experience with libertarianism, which I understand your second generation, that things like drugs uh, or other things that are kind of libertine that, or, or just no rule uh, rulers telling you, you can't do them. Uh, 
have you noticed that it seems that everybody is libertarian in some way, but to universally be intellectually consistent, very few people meet that standard. Have you noticed that? Yep. Um, I actually think that it's um, a comfort thing sometimes to work through some of the issues that like I think up of, of like, what does it look to not have laws on this? Like, it takes some time of thinking through, like, how would that actually work in society? And the further we get away from personal responsibility in our society and the government answering the questions, the harder it's going to be for us to understand what it looks like as the power of the individual. Yes, that that makes that makes so much sense. Um, yeah. You know, and also with that, I often think about like people like AOC, like the worst of the worst, if you're against the Democrat side, like her voice. And the thing that I've noticed with the socialist side of our government lately is that they are incredibly good at spotting the problems. So she can say something that I'm like, yeah, that is a problem. It's that they're their solutions are completely wrong from a libertarian point of view or really from a human nature point of view. Um, that it's instead of saying this is the problem and we should fix it through our, our individuals, through our towns, through our county states, like as small as possible, they want to throw a blanket all across the entire country and call it good. And the reality is, is that's never going to work in a country like the United States. It might work for Denmark, Finland, and all the other ones, but we're looking at little tiny small states. So if your little state wants to be socialist, let that little state be socialist. What difference does it make to us in Wyoming if New York is paying for their own socialist bill, then let them do that. But they don't get to do it on the backs of the people in the middle part of the country where we actually make money. So for you, it's not so much a government making rules and ruling the lives of others that's the problem it's just if it's done on a big scale that's when it's a problem is that am i understanding correctly nope. i wouldn't want to live in one of those states but if that's how that state wants to run itself it can the, like i'm just saying i wouldn't i wouldn't want to be part of that but so, the, if the state by the state you mean if the the go- people calling themselves government within that jurisdictional area <laughs> I guess that's even like our definitions of government because in this, we've lost this in our society. I feel like the government is the people that we are the ones who are governing ourselves. If we give that away, then that is what the the people in the society have given away. Um, And I think it's why we're tending so far left right now is because we've given away so much for so long. Um, I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Like, I think that it would, I don't know. I guess I've never been to some of the super most socialist countries in the world. Maybe they do have a life, but um, I think that there's a lot of issues within giving away that power, but I don't think that Wyoming should be able to stand in the way of some other crazy head doing that. If that's what the people want. And that's kind of something that I have struggled with over the years. That's that that idea of uh, I might not like it, 99 people might not like it, but then there's one person that does. And what right do the 99 that's have? That's a person with the power, right? Yeah. Well, and I mean, you know, elections are that way too. I was um, debating with somebody about the one person tax, not um, that we just passed in Fremont County, and they said, why should the majority get to tax the minority? And I'm like, what? you're right. Like, I don't know what the answer is, how to, how to ever do something like that. So maybe just don't do it. You know, there's a good question I was asked. Do you have the right, do you ever have the right to delegate uh, a, a right that to somebody else that you don't have yourself? Like pass off the, the bar. <laughs> Yeah, like if if I don't have a right to go down to your street corner and see somebody roll through the stop sign at three miles an hour, if I don't have a go a right to go demand sixty dollars from them, and you don't have a right to go demand sixty dollars from them, can the two of us get together and hire a third party to go demand sixty dollars from them? 
do you think that that's kind of what some people do with guns though? Like we, we, some person may not want to purchase a gun or have a gun in their home, but they know they're safe because their neighbors have guns and that they're protecting them in some respect. Um, like I know for a long time we hadn't gotten into the gun purchasing area, but I knew I lived in Wyoming and um, I knew that we were relatively protected if it from an outside source. So maybe we do kind of advocate that already in some ways on just a human nature. Like I don't, I, I may or may not have guns now, but, um, <laughs> but that was Jared's joke that if I have, if I won the election, one too many politicians was going to know how many guns he had. But, um, <laughs> but, but the truth of the matter is that I do feel like in society, we kind of naturally put that um, responsibility on some people rather than other, or if we don't necessarily want the responsibility of owning a weapon or um, something like that. So I could see that being a place as far as being the tax collector. I don't know. I kind of like the idea that I'm exploring it in my thoughts right now of the volunteers. And if we ask instead of tell how much further and how much more money would we possibly be able to collect? Yeah. And uh... Is that you can have, you can have yourself as an asshole still, but don't help anybody. That's all right. That's up to them. But <laughs> what does it look like to ask rather than tell? Yeah, and that's kind of a an ends versus means way to look at it. In other well, words, still are gonna, I, 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 I don't know. Like, I get what you're saying. You might be right. I might be somewhere hanging out in the middle of my canyon by saying that with your idea of the two sides. It's just something I have to ask myself is if, if I don't have the right to do something, then I shouldn't look at, well, yeah, but how are we going to pick the cotton if I don't do this? Well, the cotton doesn't get picked. It's not about the ends of the cotton getting picked. It's, it's about the means of not owning slaves or not taxing people or not fining them for rolling through a stop sign or telling them those kinds of things. I don't know. It's interesting to ponder. We have to live smaller. Like to make all this work, we can't have, I mean, maybe we can, maybe we can have a rolling society of all the things if we just let the free market take control. But I think that some of the things that we come to expect the government to do for us, maybe didn't ever need to be placed as big as they are. Like some of the infrastructure things and whatnot. I think that that's kind of a struggle sometimes. Like, we have this huge bill, but why do we have this huge bill? And is like the ends really worth the means? Yeah, I I like something Tom Woods joked around about. He says, so because uh, the big joke in voluntarism is who would build the roads? Because mm -hmm. that's the most frequent argument that comes up. I think and so, yes, we're. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And so Tom Woods has this is just this funny way of putting it. He says, so what? He says, if there wasn't government, I'd be over here and there would be a Sears over there. And I just stand there scratching my head wondering how I'm going to get there. <laughs> like, yep. no, I think the free market could come up with long, hard, flat things. You know, we, we've come up yep. with a few more impressive things. Uh, interesting. Well, and we talked about that a little bit last week, I think, was how much further we would be on roads if the free market was actually, if the people weren't in control of it rather than the government standard. Um, it's funny in Riverton, we have this really dangerous, dangerous um, crosswalk in town. It goes across the highway. It's been there as a bike path for 15, 16 years. I don't know, pretty close uh, for a lot of my formative life. I've used it for years and years and years. Well, this year they put I don't know how many thousands of dollars in, they put a light in the middle of the road. And I feel like that light should have always have been there from the first day they put it in. And the way that they designed it, it's been in less than six months. Somebody's already taken out the light pole. Um, oh, it got really? down yesterday. And so I was sitting there thinking about like, how much does that now cost society? Because the way they designed it because of what they did rather than coming to the people and being like, all right, what is the best way for us to do this the cheapest way possible? Because what they did was not cheap. And now it's going to be, I mean, less than six months in, 
how many times is that poor little light pole going to get taken out with all of its computers so that it flashes all the lights and stuff and maybe it should hang above or do something different but I just you look at that and it is like some complete overpowering government waste on something that's needed but maybe their solution wasn't proper right right so in in more of the the smaller uh, area of government that you've mentioned you would prefer to having people in California making decisions for people in Riverton Wyoming um, if Riverton Wyoming did have a group of people that uh, agreed to something uh, and you got 51% or 90% of the people to agree to something and there was a law can you think of a time that it's ever okay that it would ever be okay to break a law Would it ever be okay to break law? Like, can you think of any type of law that maybe has ever existed that you say, wait a minute, you know, regular human beings put that law in place. But if that was the law, I would not follow that. That's just wrong. Well, I think it depends on what the laws are in that case. Um, I mean, I, I feel like so often we focus on what the laws of are today. Today, I'm a law-abiding citizen, but that doesn't mean that I agree with the laws of tomorrow. I mean, there was one day when people were able to drink alcohol in the United States, and the next day they weren't, and they were all of a sudden um, behind the law. So I, I, I think that there's always a place to possibly break every law if the time is there, but you're always going to have to face the consequences. And if the consequences aren't the law, what are the consequences to yourself and to your own worldview rather? I mean, okay. How about a mask mandate? <laughs> it is now yeah. illegal to go out and wear, not wear your mask in Wyoming, but that doesn't necessarily like maybe the consequences are worth it for me to not wear my mask. Maybe I'm, maybe I, have that bad asthma or I don't want to wear a mask or all the reasons that we have for not wearing a mask or wearing a mask. It's not the law that makes us wear the mask or not wear the mask. It's not the law that makes me put on my seatbelt or not put on my seatbelt. It's science that makes it's Newton telling me that if I go, if I stop really quick, I'm going to keep going. That's why I wear a seatbelt. <laughs> So right. you can choose to not wear a seatbelt, but there's going to be natural consequences for that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it does kind of come down to you and, and to me. Yep. And if they did make a law in Riverton that said uh, the white folk may not marry the Native American folk from the reservation. And if you see anybody doing that, you need to call and report it right away. I'm guessing you probably wouldn't obey that law to call and report it. Well, they'd probably report me first. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, exactly. Like, I mean, a law is only as good as the people around it that are enforcing it. Um, and, and, and not even the people like, cause I think that, I think it's pretty awesome. And I don't know how many counties have done this, but our sheriff took the um, stand of, I'm not going to, I'm not writing citations. My deputies are not writing citations for people not wearing masks. Be safe, do what you need to do, but we're not wasting our time on that. And so by them doing that, they have essentially nullify what any of the ramifications from the law would have been for not wearing a mask. Now, if you believe that the mask is protecting you, him saying that did not change what that mask may or may not be doing for you. That's a good because, point. Yeah. The law doesn't, the law doesn't, in my opinion, the law doesn't really do a lot. We don't run around not killing people because there's a law there. We don't run around killing people because it's wrong and we don't take human life. Right. Right. I, I agree. And, and I feel the same that I, I put myself as kind of the decision maker about whether or not I do the same as what a law says. Um, it is really in the, in the long run, it comes down to, do I want to do this thing or not? Do I think it's morally right or smart or, or whatever? Well, we have to have education with that. You can't just have a population without laws and expect them to 
know exactly what they do. I mean, it's just like a baby is born innocent and you have to teach them what is right or wrong. And the same should happen in society. And that's what we're using our laws kind of for now is, well, that's against the law. We don't want that behavior rather than teaching people why we don't want that behavior. What What do you think of the idea of instead of having legal consequences to behaviors, having natural consequences? Um, I think that there's a lot more learning ability to come out of natural consequences. Um, sometimes you have to, I think it's hard to find the natural consequence of not wearing your seatbelt because I cannot wear my seatbelt every day of my life. And the last day of my life was the day that it mattered that I wore my seatbelt. So, I mean, that's a, that's a tough lot, <laughs> natural law to learn, but, um, you know, I, there's, I, I remember watching a show when I was a little kid, um, maybe a teenager and some kid had stolen CDs and he had to stand outside of the store holding a sign that said, I stole from the store. So that public humiliation, I mean, we don't want somebody in the stocks necessarily anymore abusing people, but there is a level of paying back to society by saying I did something wrong to society and how that could possibly curtail some, um, some bad behaviors. Mm -hmm. Kind of a, a public shaming or a something of not, that nature. Not mean, but I mean, there is some use to that, I think. Yeah. D Especially you, for smaller little things. Yeah. It, with your moral code, uh, do you believe that right and wrong apply the same to everyone? Like every human being is... Mm. I don't even know if right and wrong apply to every situation. I mean, I, I think that it's a day-to-day, -day, like how we go through our lives. There's, I'm not saying that to be a bad person or not, but there's definitely a right time to do things and a wrong time to do things. And I don't know if it's as easy as just saying it applies to every person. I don't know what's going on in another person's life. And who am I to say? what I think is right is right in my life is right in their life, even for that moment and time for them. So if it's, and kind of what my thinking was, if is, if it's wrong to punch a three-year-old child in the nose, that's probably always wrong. If it's wrong for me, is it also wrong for Bill and Johnny and you and yeah, I would say that there's probably basics out there like that, that are probably wrong across the board, but I don't know if it, it wouldn't apply for everything. And I don't know, it's probably always wrong to hurt the innocent. Yeah. That's, there's some things that I think that maybe you shouldn't steal. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't. <laughs> Personal property. Weird. <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't initiate violence. Um, so yeah, there's some things like that, that it, it I think there's like, a code for that in libertarianism, isn't there? Oh, that, uh, the non-aggression principle NAP. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that that's part of like our principles that you can't go out and just take from everybody else. You can't just go out and hurt from everybody else. There is some self-governance happening, but how much more effective it is as self-governance rather than just being like someone over the top of you telling you. Yeah. And, and I, I wonder what level it would be okay to have somebody that you didn't agree to have tell it, you know, if, if I don't agree for you to tell me what to do, even if we're on a very small local level, I wonder, I wonder how that could, how eight people could transfer rights to Bill to rule over you if you didn't want Bill to rule yeah, over that's you. An interesting, I'm going to have to think on it. I don't know that, if I have an answer today. That's what I have to, I, I ponder it. And, and I was, God, I'm not always like a quick thinker, like on deep things like that. I might have to have some time. <laughs> oh, same here. It's, it's, and I, and then I hit this point where I'm like, wait a minute, I, I still don't have an answer for that. Sometimes it takes me a year or two and, and then I'm going, oh, well, what if so and so? And yeah, and finally yep. it comes around. Is there, uh, this is something we talked about last time we chatted. Um, and that is, is it okay for a government, even on a really small level, to make you pay for something? that you don't agree, force you to fund it? 
So I think that it's so hard when um, we have governments the way that we think of governments now where it is few elected um, and it depends how high up that government is. Because like I say, like I kind of think of the government as the people. Like you can't, ta you can't, I, I always find it so interesting when they say the government is um, going to increase money revenues. And it's like, well, the people are the government. We're the one who pay that. So what does that actually mean? It means taxes. Um, I don't know. Like, I always thought it would be cool if on our income tax, if we have to have an income tax. I don't want an income tax, but if we had it, if you took all of the programs that the U.S. funds when we do our federal taxes and you mark the ones that are important to you, what we would know which programs we needed to keep and which ones we needed to go away. Because maybe I think it's really important for something to happen, but nobody else in the entire United States does. Well, then really is it the entire United States' job to to fund that. And so I, I've thought that for a long time of what it would even look like if we just ask people in a way that their money was connected, what is important to our population as a whole opposed to anyone else. But the reality would be to not have tax, not have income tax. And I think I've been trying to gauge taxes. They're all bad, but I think income tax and by far property tax is the worst. Um, we're either renting the land or we own the land. You can't be somewhere in between. Right, right. Yeah, it, and it's it's interesting even the word tax. It, it's interesting how we use words. I shouldn't say we because there's I don't like the word we, but <laughs> many I of us many of us individuals we use softer words. I remember when I was a a cop when there was a deer that would get hit by a car and it was my job to go and if you know it's limping along it's going to starve to death over the next weeks i would shoot it in the head to kill it but when i got on the radio the protocol was to say i've dispatched the deer <laughs> and it was just a more pleasant thing for anybody that might be listening to a scanner in truth i blew the brains out of a deer i killed a deer and it's interesting how you and I have been taught our whole lives that if a group of people steal money from us and they don't do it through robbery or through burglary, we call it taxes. Yeah, they do it through extortion. Ah, that's a nasty word. What else can we come up with? Ah, they, they already came up with a, a definition of rose. That's a flower. Ooh, let's use tax. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, that's nice and soft. <laughs> so I think of 1984. The most important part of that entire book beyond like the whole body of the book is the appendix. And the reason that part is so important is it talks exactly what you're talking about. That um, when we shorten our vocabulary, that we actually lose our ability to think. So when we just like use one word for a bunch of things, how that like creates only that word and we've lost all the other words. And so it takes away our freedom. Um, I think an easy place to like think about this is in Alaska, the Native Americans up there have so many different words for the different types of snow. In Wyoming, we can describe different kinds of snow. In Florida, they wouldn't have any idea what that there's there's different types of snow. What are right. you talking about? And so like, as you stop describing things in different and different ways or having different words for things, it makes it so they all get lumped into one thing. And it doesn't mean that it's actually truthful. And you actually start losing the ability to think of things outside of that description. And so I think sometimes when we change the word from like, killing the I mean it's it's just like what they are doing to the buffalo in Yellowstone right now they um it's calling them or I mean they're gonna go out and kill all of those buffalo whether you think that's right or wrong like just call it what it is like if you're not wanting the ramifications for saying that you're killing a thousand buffalo then make it sound something that people are like what's that word mean I don't know I'm gonna go right. on with my life right right well so 
I am uh, so grateful that you are willing to chat with me again, and hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Um, what haven't I asked you today that's that's popped into your head that might be a nice thing to just kind of add? Is there anything we kind of along lines what we're chatting about that we haven't talked about? Hmm. I don't know. I, I kind of like, I definitely have to explore the ideas of how we get things without taxing and what, what it is. I'm still chewing a little bit on our last conversation of who the society is and the community and how all of our roles exist. I mean, and I think that it's, it's another thing where as you start down the line of libertarianism, volunteerism, anything beyond what um, we have now, whatever that is. I think people like to call us uh, capital, um, crony capitalism. I think we have crony socialism, but, um, yes. but I think as we tromps down this path, we have to realize that I'm not saying these things for tomorrow. The reality is, is that it's going to start taking a lot of people, a lot of work, a lot of individuals to start opening their eyes and seeing that we do have the power as individuals and that it is us doing what's right and wrong. It's the non-aggression principle of what we do in our day to day that's going to make society change over the actual laws that are put over our heads. Well said, well said. Well, Thank you again so much for chatting with me today, Bethany. And uh, will you do it again sometime? Yes, I, I love to talk, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Well, we will keep communicating. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. And by the way, if uh, anybody would like to connect with you uh, online, is there a good way to do that? Um, they can probably just find me at Baldus for Liberty. And then um, I'm on Facebook and all of that as well. So sounds great. And if anybody gets in touch with a show, I can connect you. Well, thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you.